Yeah. So one thing that I noticed uh, in several of the sessions today is a lot of the people uh, have a Christian orientation, mm -hmm. but their belief in travel is not faith-based, mm -hmm. it's evidence-based, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and the way I'm trying to make sense of that is this. Um, it's, it's not as if, you know, it, it, there has to be a, a certain consistency, right? Mm -hmm. So people will, you know, people will say things like, um, well, I'll, I'll just get to my question. No, you're fine. What would it take, so if it's evidence based, mm -hmm. what would it take to convince you that you were wrong? Is yeah. there anything, any experiment, because you know, have a list of the ten things, this was bad, this was bad, this was bad, this was bad. Yeah. And, and I got a dispute with about the Coriolis effect and sure. the whole down. You know, I can, I, I can hold my own on some of the scientific arguments with my mm -hmm. But that's not it. The question is, what would it take to you? Is there any definitive experiment that could be done that, you know, you know Gus Tyson or somebody else does, where when it's done, you say, you know what, I was wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it would... Thanks, so. I, I would have to be a part of that experiment or whatever it is. Have an understanding of what we're trying to prove so that we can have the evidence and have it be impartial. So, you, so you'd have to... It couldn't be something that somebody else did and reported on. Even if it was somebody you trusted, you'd want to you'd want to see with your own eyes. And you know that goes back to faith. Okay. Right? The Bible is a second and third party testimony, right? We weren't there during that time, and so it's a belief. This is my next question. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's a belief, right? And so if if the Bible confirms, right, or, or, or leads a person into a geocentric environment where the sun and the moon are moving over us and the earth doesn't move, I think that with, the, with what you were saying with the Christian idea, mm -hmm. that helps solidify the previous yes. notion that I mean, evidence is what it is. Somebody said to me this morning that... He believed in flat earth because it was the only belief system that was that made sense to him given Noah's flood. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, but that's assuming that Noah's flood happened. Right. And if you didn't, if you were heliocentric, you know, and believed in the round yeah. earth, but you didn't believe it, then that wouldn't have to be explained. Right. But in his point of view, so I didn't want to say that that's why he believed it, because that's not why, it's not faith-based, mm -hmm. but it was kind of like he needed, that was a fundamental fact that he needed to make sense of. Mm -hmm. So the, the two, does any experiment pop into your mind, something that's kind of a great unknown, the thing that nobody's ever settled to your satisfaction, but if you could be there and watch it happen, it's kind of, this is a defining moment, mm -hmm. it's either going to be that it was right, that it was wrong, mm -hmm. and you're going to watch it happen. What would that experiment do? This community, and I don't mean to brag or anything, I'm, I'm humble if you see my videos. I know you um, are, just from watching them. This community loves me. If I were to have a fully funded rocket go uh -huh. straight ahead into outer space, and I was able to live to tell about it, these people would seriously question flat earth. So you have to go above 70,000 feet. I would have to go past the Carmen line, which is the 62 mile mark, which mainstream science says is the barrier. No, I, I can't do the math in my head. 62 miles is how many feet? Um, it's about 330 meters, 30,000 meters. 30,000 meters. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be. Uh, okay, so that, yeah, so that so that's about 80 or 90,000 feet. Oh, no, it's much further than that. Um, I mean, we, I guess yeah, we could do the math. Okay, okay now I, I can just, I can, I can <coughs> do the math later, but mm -hmm. the reason I bring up the 70 to 80,000 yeah. feet is because... I the Blackbird went that high. I, yeah, I was yeah. interviewing the, the United Airlines pilot, and mm -hmm. he said, you can't see the curvature of the Earth at 30,000 feet, so the other side did it, the airline pallet turned on it. He, yeah. said, he said, no, there exactly. wouldn't have to be, nobody can see it. Right. Yeah, it, even it, mainstream science says that. Right. Mm -hmm. 
but he said that he was in the Air Force in Vietnam, and that there was a, uh, a, a, a there was a guy who wrote a book about the plane. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it was a bomber. It was a super, super high-level bomber that went to seven or eighty thousand feet. Yeah. The oxygen mask, everything. And he said that at that height, you could see the curvature of the Earth. You'd have, to, you'd want to go higher than that. I'll answer that question, but with yeah. that being said, and I'm not trying to be super conspiratorial or anything, yeah. but I'll be honest, because I, now I just question everything. Yeah, I understand. Who's to say that those who built that airplane mm -hmm. built the windows to have a slight curve to them for okay. aerodynamics, for example? Okay. And the reasoning behind the window being curved, its explanation is aerodynamics. Yep. But the underlying explanation that you wouldn't be told because you don't have that type of clearance mm -hmm. is to make the pilots believe that it's a round earth. Does that make sense? Yes. So in this reality that I have found, just my experience, there's the what the public gets to hear and what the underlying explanation is really about. So there's two different, it's it's called um, esoteric and exoteric. The lemonade was for you? Yeah. Okay. It's esoteric and exoteric. Okay. So they have a communication with themselves where they talk to each other with an uh, uh, esoteric type of dialogue, but then there's an exoteric dialogue that happens with the public. There's yeah. two different well, things. I, I, and I see this with scientists yeah. in the, the, the shorthand. Mm -hmm. yeah. When Hillary Clinton was doing her campaign before uh, Trump became president, she was talking about how we're going to hit that glass ceiling and we're going to break that glass ceiling. So, flat earthers will interpret that as breaking through the dome firmament to, to find out <laughs> what's above us. Which, which was a good thing or a bad thing? Which is, which is a, 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 an interesting way for her to say we'll break the, that glass uh, above us. Yeah. Right? Okay. But the public heard we as women will get to where we want to be because because she was speaking because she was yes yeah. she was speaking about she was speaking metaphorically yeah. where the public thinks she's talking about women but she's really talking about how they want to find out what's above us and oh i see almost like a dog whistle almost like a coded mm -hmm. yeah or, okay yeah let's and so let, let me let me try a um there were two experiments i thought of today myself mm -hmm. And I don't want to get into the Coriolis effect and all that, because I, I think some of them, I mean, it's actually quite quite clever that, you know, like the Foucault pendulum. Yeah. You, you don't have to explain the Foucault pendulum the way that he did today. All you need to do is say that the heavens are moving. Mm -hmm. If the heavens are moving, the Foucault pendulum works the way it does. You know, fine, different perspective. Mm -hmm. Coriolis effect, same thing. If you shoot north-south, According to inertia, right, the bullet is also going to be traveling just in the same way that you took a ball and you, you were on a train, mm -hmm. you threw the ball up, you catch the ball, mm -hmm. the ball is not going to land over there. It's the same with the bullet. Right. So, I mean, so, so there, are, there are kind of physics things yeah. that... But well, you're also in an enclosed when, system. Yes. The train yeah. is an enclosed system. It, it so is gravity. Right? It, 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 because you, the farther you get away, the, the less of the, the force of gravity. When, when, so, but, but, but rather than you know, chip away on the edges and stuff like yeah. that, I wanted to pick up on on two that you guys seem interested in yourselves. Mm -hmm. One was that experiment about going out um, 60 miles from Chicago. Yes. And I did the math. Yeah. And it's correct. Mm -hmm. The math was all absolutely correct. If you go out, the Sears Tower is 1,350 feet. You don't yep. only have to go out 45 miles not to see it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Now, so what he said today was, but because of the superior mirage, mirage. effect, mm -hmm. right? Okay, but that means there's a definitive experiment that you can do. Right. Because the superior mirage effect should disappear. If you went out 100 miles, mm -hmm. so what if you went out on Lake Michigan? And I and I asked him. I yeah. forget what his name is. She 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 uh, what, what was the name? The name of the fellow who gave that talk? I I haven't watched many 
uh, Skiba. Oh, Skiba. Skiba. Okay, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I asked him today, I said, how can you only run out 60 miles? Why don't you go out 100 miles? <coughs> because at 100 miles, you know, face it, if you're right, mm -hmm. you could see Chicago, and they couldn't explain it the Superior Mirage yeah. effect. But if you couldn't see Chicago, mm -hmm. then you're wrong. Yeah. And that seems like kind of that cleaving moment. Yeah. What if you did that? What if you went out in a boat 100 miles from the shore on Lake Michigan and looked back and Chicago wasn't there? Did that convince you that you were wrong? Unfortunately, there are too many variables. Okay. So those variables are the water temperature. Okay. Temperature of the air. Me meaning that it was obstructed vision? Thanks a lot, man. Yeah. That's for your Yes. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Meaning you just you couldn't okay. see like hey, too, too much water vapor in here, too much yeah, dust, so too much. I mean, atmosphere is thick, which is why you don't see stars on the horizon. Dust by the way, because yeah. atmosphere itself is thick, yeah. even if clear. Yeah. And, and it, it optically you can't you can't see you stars. Can't get through it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so when <clears throat> when the water is being heated by the sun, it's going to create water vapor to come up from the water from the lake, right? And so it's going to create that, that mirroring effect that will be raised. Whereas if you do this type of experiment, for example, you know, up in Minnesota, right, Lake Mille Lacs, and you get 20 miles, right, over what is right now just a, a glossy sheen of ice yeah. where there's no wake or anything, that would be the that, best. Why not do it on that day, though? Or, or like the, the guy said, he played a tape and he said, uh, well, you know, you can't cherry pick, you can't pick and choose which days the superior mirage effect is on some days but not on others. Mm -hmm. Well, but the point is, if a flat earth researcher went out there and ever couldn't see Chicago, mm -hmm. if there was ever one day when they couldn't see Chicago mm -hmm. from 60 miles away, then the theory is wrong. Well, that would that's again still based on the weather. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there there's just really too many variables in in the water temperature and the power of the lens one day you could probably see it and the next day you can't well then the variable is the weather okay. and the water temperature and the temperature of the air okay. if you could do it at like 6 a.m. when the water temperature is much right. much cooler because the sun hasn't been beating down on it you might have different results okay. where if, a, if you go out at 6 p.m. Uh, in June you're gonna you, you see what I'm after though, right? I do, the yeah. idea is if you could have ideal <laughs> conditions where mm -hmm. you would say in advance, you know, well, let, let, let me move to the other experiment yeah. that I thought of. The other experiment was this. So I checked before I came, uh, I checked uh, my kayak.com. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I right. found that there was a direct flight between Santiago, Chile, mm -hmm. and Auckland, New Zealand. Okay. Which means that they have to fly over Antarctica okay. to get there. Sure. Which, according to Flat Earth, shouldn't be allowed. Yeah. How do you explain that? Did you buy the ticket? No. Okay, so you haven't gone on the flight? No. So how do you know? So you're saying I'd, I'd have to do it. Yeah. If you, if you did it, mm -hmm. and you got there, mm -hmm. would it convince you? If I could bring my own... Uh, measurements and the things that the flat earth community would agree with me bringing on the on the flight like these are the things that we feel would best help you uh, determine whether or not this is true of course yeah I don't see why not I'm not gonna hide from you know that opportunity but do I have eight thousand dollars for a flight I don't and I'm sorry I can't offer that. I'm I know, right? You, I'm just asking you the theoretical mm -hmm. question of what it would take. The reason I'm interested in this question in yeah. particular is because I'm a philosopher of science. Mm -hmm. And there's a famous philosopher you might have heard of named Karl Popper mm -hmm. who makes the argument that the defining characteristic of science is that it rules something out. Mm -hmm. And he uses the example of Einstein predicting that the starlight was going to be bent a little bit uh, when, when it was close to the sun because the sun attracts 
uh, the sun has gravitational force, so, so the starlight would be bent. Mm -hmm. And so this was kind of a crucial experiment. Mm -hmm. And so his big point was science takes a risk, and, will, and if the risk doesn't come out, then the theory is wrong. Okay. And, and what I'm impressed with is that you're not ruling that out. You're just saying you'd have to do the experiment. I'd have to see so it for myself. The hold down, the, uh, I call it hold down, mm -hmm. but you know what I mean, Chicago disappear, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm going to rewrite that and say Chicago disappear. Um, that one wouldn't because too many variables for the weather. But the idea about the flying over Antarctica, that's a more definitive experiment. Yeah, we could try it out. Because the, when I, um, I guess there are all sorts of answers that you could give from a cloud perspective, but the, Okay, but, but that, okay, so we're in, we're in the ballpark on that. Yeah, because I mean, anybody can look up something and say, well, this flight is going to go here and this flight is going to go there. Right. And what you're assuming is that when you go from, you know, South America to Africa to Australia, right. and you really take that flight, that's the way that it would go, right? In connecting right. flights and stuff. Right, because they've run out of gas. Right. Right. But did you know that, you know, just a kind of a side note, did you know that when an airplane has to make a stop for gasoline, it's not called a stop? Like, people can't leave the airplane. So it's not actually called no, I've been on uh, that. layaway, or, you know, or, um, you know, layaway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so people assume that that's true, so then this flight over Antarctica must be true. Because why would they lie about that, right? Well, I'm just saying, like, they've, they've concluded that this flight from Minnesota to California, oh, this see. is true. This flight from Florida to Tokyo, Japan is true. It. So thus, this flight over Antarctica must be true. So you're saying, because we're conditioned to think that flights need to make fuel stops mm -hmm. in all these other circumstances. Or drop passengers off. We therefore them. conclude that that one would also have to. Yeah. You ever been asked that question before? No. When you're out on the, on the street, probably don't sit down and talk. <laughs> the public doesn't come up with that type of question. Okay. Um, um, they do come up with, well, what about airplane flights and stuff? And well, I I've have. Been think, I've been thinking about this a little bit. Yeah, connection flights and stuff. So. You know, I've, I've been thinking about this a little bit because um, I wanted, you know, my goal in coming here was to take it seriously, mm -hmm. and respectfully find out why you, you believe yeah. what you believe. Um, yeah, I don't me, feel any me, malicious intent. Let, let me ask you the second hardest question that I got there. Mm -hmm. I'll work up to the easy one. Um, one thing that I'm picking up in the conversations back and forth, and, that, and I've heard people come up in the hall Well, let me put it this way. It's a feeling I have that nobody has really addressed overtly. And the feeling I get is that it's just assumed that there's somebody behind this, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the round of conspiracy. Yeah. But nobody said who, and nobody said why, mm -hmm. and, and, and I really don't know. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and I feel like I've walked into a room where everybody knows what the answer to that question would be but me. Yeah. Can you tell me what it is? You can certainly speculate, right? Okay. Yeah. Would you consider yourself a spiritual person? Not really? Not really? Okay. So, if we were created, yeah. just, you know, just for sake of argument or whatever, right. and we were created by a perfect, all-knowing, all-wise um, being that always had the best interests in mind for us, right. and then there's another being that doesn't. Mm -hmm. It has the complete opposite viewpoint towards I know the human race. Right. And so <clears throat> would it be would it be possible that because this entity has the ability to help manifest things in a person's life like finances, fame, notoriety and such, that these groups of people would be able to channel that somehow, maybe through seances or various other ways to channel into that particular realm 
So you're talking about yeah. mm -hmm. working through people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So kind of like, who are the people? They're the people that he's most equipped to give fame, fortune, standing in the world mm -hmm. enough to cover up yes. what needs to be covered up. Because <coughs> it's really about but, compartmentalization. But, but why? Here, here, I still can't understand. But even if that's true, mm -hmm. what's the advantage of covering it up? I mean, it's a heck of a lot of work. Mm -hmm. and, and plus, people are not that smart and they're not that capable to cover things up. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I look at Washington, D.C., and I see them screwing, screwing up a lot of things. Do you think that they purposefully let certain information out when they withhold others? Maybe. Because you and, think? But, but I mean, that, but that's the other question, right? Because if it is they couldn't a, hide a, a blow conspiracy job. that they're right. that they're hiding, mm -hmm. why are there the clues like the uh, is a thing today that if you look at the letter in the alphabet for NASA, I think mm -hmm. it was it as of the six six six. Why would there be any clues? For oh, like Demetria? Yeah. yeah. I okay. mean, why, why would if they were that good to cover it up? Mm -hmm. They have to kind of be. They have to be good enough to cover it up so that most people don't see it. Mm -hmm. They're not so good to cover it up that you guys don't see it. How yes, does that happen? Truth hidden in plain sight. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's the idea that things that are so obvious out in reality are best hidden right in front of you. All right. Fantastic. Uh, it's a way that they communicate with each other. You know, it's a way that okay. they're able to, again, like before, the Hegelian dialect of esoteric and exoteric. If they're able to control the narrative, right, because mm -hmm. they're control freaks. So if they're able to control the narrative, like Judge Judy, right? Let's just say, for argument's sake, Judge Judy is an actor. Okay. Or maybe she used to be a judge, but saw or maybe they had a conversation with her and offered her something to act out cases right. in each person that goes on judge Judy and that's in the jury room you know jury room right right, right. are all actors <laughs> could you go out of your way to do you go out of your way to commit crime or be a result of crime? No, most people don't. You know, most people mm -hmm. don't. And there are those options to go on Judge Judy, you know. And maybe there are there, there is some truth to some of the shows on Judge Judy, for example, that are true. Like somebody, somebody's dog uh, bit my son and I want reparations for it, right? Because it costs $2,000 to take my son to the right. to the hospital, right? What does that have to do with the cabal who's controlling them? So they control the narrative. They literally control oh, and they're scripted. Yeah. Okay. So if they're able to control the script instead of the randomness that human beings are, they eliminate that completely. So somebody's benefiting? Yes. Yeah. They're benefiting from the narrative that's being played out in its psychological warfare. You know, What's the like, benefit? well, for example, with um, these shootings that are going on right now. You know, if if they were just for argument's sake to create a situation where they had a shooting. And these people may or may not have died. I'm not saying that they may or may not have died. That, that's not the point. The point is, is the aftermath of it. And the people that come on camera and talk about their mm -hmm. their experience, right. the, the, the loved one that was lost, for right. example. And if a lady comes on camera and says, I don't want your prayers, I don't want your thoughts, right. I want gun control. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty specific narrative to right. be played out by a mother who just lost her child. You think she's acting? I think that there would be more evidence in my heart to show that she's acting and that she is a paid 
uh, person by the establishment to control the future narrative of said gun control. Okay. And that's just an idea, you know. If you're using that as an example for the, for the bigger... For the bigger picture, yeah. yeah. And so if they were, if, if everybody, you know, a thousand years ago knew that the earth was flat and motionless and the sun, stars, and the moon above us moved and we did not, over a period of time, they understand that changing that yeah. is going to take hundreds of years, you know? So, well, yeah, I mean, it was... Um, yeah, I'm keeping you from reading. No, you're Please fine. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm thinking of... Because um, I, I studied history of science, and I think back to Aristarchus mm -hmm. and Ptolemy. I mean, these ideas go you know, go back a long way. Mm -hmm. People believed that the Earth was flat longer than they believed that it was round. Mm -hmm. uh, but that narrative changed in about... Well, I don't say for everybody, but I mean, it started to change for the intelligentsia around you know, 1000 BC, okay. know, something in there. Mm -hmm. um, but it didn't, you know, catch on mm -hmm. for, you know, much later. I've got the dates wrong. Right. Like Aristarchus was, was some, sometime in the BC, but it, you know, that didn't really begin to be a paradigm shift mm -hmm. uh, until, until much later. Um, okay, so you, so you answered, so, so those were some big ones. Um, well, does that make sense, though? Like, well, if they're able to control the narrative through the educational system, right? Yeah. And they're control freaks, like I said before, they're able to convince the youth who are very early in learning yeah. development yeah. something that isn't true. And at that time, a child's going to believe it. No, no, I, it's coming I understand. From authority. I, yeah, I, 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 I understand. If if that would, yeah, I, I get the, I get the, what yeah. you're saying is, you can teach a child anything that you want. From, you from can. Yes. Yeah. And so, with that being said, adults would never question the idea of it, the Earth being flat, yeah. because we were taught. At such an early age, that authority same experience you had, yeah, right? said this, that, and the other. It, until you did. <laughs> it didn't even cross my mind. Okay, never thought to question it. And I, you know, like with my CF and stuff and other various things that I have personally experienced, I started to develop a seed of doubt in my heart with this place, this reality that we live in. And I feel like a lot of people could probably say. I don't completely trust the government, but I don't think that they would do anything so bad as to lie to us about where we live. But what if that is the core lie to make you think? It's like the greatest lie the devil ever told is that it didn't exist. So, I've heard you a couple of times say, what if? Mm -hmm. Or to, you know, to raise a question mm -hmm. that maybe I can't answer, maybe you can't answer. Um, a couple of the presentations have kind of used the strategy of, um, you know, this is not a slam dunk uh, you know, experiment, but do your own experiment. But, you know, at least here's a question you can ask. Here's a question you can ask. Here's a question you can ask. And, you know, with the expectation that it should be, you know, somebody who believes in the round or ought to be able to provide an answer for it. Sure. And vice versa. Right? You're right. So, so in some ways, it's almost like each side thinks they have the truth. Exactly. Each side is arguing evidence, and they're saying, well, you should explain what I believe. No, you should explain you know, the other side of it. Mm -hmm. But science has a very well-worked-out way of settling those kind of disputes. How do they do that? Um, so, and this, this is exactly what I do my research. Okay. Okay, so... People have, I think, and I'll talk here from now, I'll let you eat. <laughs> yeah, thanks, man. Okay, so... Vice <laughs> versa, yeah. So, so people have a misunderstanding that if science is successful, it should be able to prove something. It mm -hmm. should be, you know, 100% confirmed, verified, whatever you want to call it. But that's how science works. Mm -hmm. That's not how science works. 
science, you know, people will say, well, evolution is just a theory, or, you know, you, there's not enough evidence for global warming, they haven't proved enough, etc. So, extremely high standards for, you know, certain things that they want, and if scientists can't provide it, then, well, you know, so why should I believe it? Mm -hmm. But here, here's the problem. Science responds, okay, so let me, let me fill in. The other half of that is, on the other hand, there are some people who believe things about the empirical world with no evidence, okay? Because right. they want to believe it or they like faith or faith or something, faith like, that. Or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. And my own, and I mean, this is my theory, this is something I'm working on, is that conspiracy theories are a mismatch in evidential standards. Mm -hmm. That conspiracy theories are where someone is, on the one hand, extremely skeptical of the things that they don't want to believe, but they're extremely gullible about the things they do want to believe. Mm -hmm. I'll give an example. Yeah. Today in the, in the time, um, no With Steve or yes. okay. No photographic evidence at all was going to convince him from NASA. Okay. It could be curved, it could be a, a wrong lens, it was fake, it was photoshopped. Every single photograph that came out, there was, you know, the standard of, it, it was a standard of proof. It would have to be proved to him, mm -hmm. you know, so that impossibly high standard that, you know, couldn't be met. On the other hand, he showed a video. I guess you went there, you didn't see the video, but he had a video with. I've seen a lot, a lot of his stuff. The Coral Castle. Okay. Um, which has these incredibly heavy stones that couldn't possibly be lifted by one person. Mm -hmm. But the claim was that one person had built this, you know, with no mortar, and it was kind of, it was like this version of the pyramids that this yeah. person had built. I think it was in Florida, California, mm -hmm. California. But they had a video, it was an old video, you mm -hmm. know, before Photoshop existed, sure. I guess. And it was, I'm not a physicist, I don't understand the, the claim that was made, but it was, you know, any basis in physics or not, but the claim was that there was a, an anti-gravity force that allowed that to happen, so that even this kind of frail dude <coughs> who owned the place was able to do this. Mm -hmm. And then they showed a picture, a video, of his wife pushing the stone that was supposed to weigh nine times, mm -hmm. and she had her tiny little hand, and she pushed it. And immediately I thought, double standard. Mm -hmm. You won't believe anything that NASA puts out because it's a picture that could be Photoshop. Mm -hmm. But I'm supposed to believe that picture mm -hmm. of the woman pushing the stone, even though that could have been done. Yeah. So this, what this comes back to for me is the following question. Um, science, scientists, um, so, so because scientists know Although they sometimes don't admit it in public, which mm -hmm. is frustrating mm -hmm. yeah, to you and to me, right? Because I think they explain what they do incorrectly mm -hmm. and get themselves in trouble. They can't prove things. Yeah. They can rule things out, mm -hmm. but they, they can't prove. Any hypothesis could have an infinite number of explanations mm -hmm. for it. Certain evidence, you know, could come up to, to uh, corroborate it later. Mm -hmm. What they do is they gather justification, which in philosophy we call warrant for mm -hmm. their belief, based on how likely it is to be <coughs> true. And so here's my next question for you. All of the what-ifs that you're saying could possibly be true. Mm -hmm. But which is more likely to be true? An Occam's razor type right, of deal? exactly. So, which is more likely to be true? Is it more likely that there's a worldwide conspiracy of the leaders uh, of our government and science and technology mm -hmm. to suppress the truth about flat earth? Or is it more likely that we us the wrong? Mm -hmm. Could it be that it's more withholding information rather than divulging everything? Is it a lie to withhold information? I think so. Yeah. I mean, in 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 the way that now, now uh, look, 
I only speak for myself on sure. this, but I'm, I'm a philosopher of science, mm -hmm. and, I, uh, and I have a, a theory that uh, what I think is distinctive about science is not the method that scientists use. Mm -hmm. Anybody can use that method. That's yeah. not distinctive to science. Mm -hmm. the, 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 it's quote unquote scientific method means you look at evidence, you make a prediction, you see if it fits. Mm -hmm. Um, what I think is distinctive about science is that they um, have an attitude of caring about evidence and using it to affect their theory. Mm -hmm. it, so it's not a method, it's a value. Okay? Okay. And so I think that withholding evidence for a scientist is a terrible thing. Mm -hmm. uh, borderline fraud. Yeah. Right? Because science. The only reason it works is because they're all checking one another's work. Because face it, they've got an ego. Mm -hmm. They want to think they're smart. If you know, you can show that somebody else's theory is wrong. Maybe yours is right. They're. I mean, I don't know how much time you might have spent on scientists, but they're they're kind of cutthroat mm -hmm. in the way that they criticize one another's theories, mm -hmm. right? And so, I can name you instances of fraud, mm -hmm. borderline fraud. Uh, maybe you heard about cold fusion uh, yeah. many years ago. Mm -hmm. So that was borderline fraud, mm -hmm. right? They, I don't think they in their hearts wanted to commit fraud, but they withheld the information that their peers needed to recreate their experiment mm -hmm. and did so in a way that screwed up the entire field until the truth finally came out that, yes. that they had made a mistake. Now, they made an error. They didn't falsify it. <laughs> data, they made an error, but I do think that withholding information is bad. Okay. So that's a long yeah, no, answer yeah, to you. Yeah, um, but, but So how does that tie in, in answer to my question then, if you think that um, science, uh, what, what were you going to say about that then, that you're withholding information? What is the scientific method, I guess? Is the scientific method exercised in the scientific community right now? Or is it that we've gone so far away from the scientific method where philosophy and theory sound much more more like a, a lady friend that's beautiful? So, so, here, so here you and I are going to agree on something that's maybe going to surprise you, mm -hmm. okay? Because I think that scientists um, need philosophy to help keep them honest about the fact that they're using is the, uh, the value of carrying that evidence. Mm -hmm. And that when they, uh, scientists believe in something that philosophers call naive realism. Okay. Which is, I see it, therefore it must be true. Mm -hmm. And there's something in the philosophy of science called the problem of uh, underdetermination, mm -hmm. which means that any given fact can be explained by an infinite number of theories. Now, you can introduce a new fact that will rule out a whole bunch of theories. There's still be an infinite number of life. Mm -hmm. And scientists hate this. Mm -hmm. They hate this idea. When they'll say, oh, that's a philosopher's problem. It's not a philosopher's problem. It's a real problem. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that science can't make progress. It just means that they will never discover truth. Yeah. So, and, and you can see why they don't want to admit that, right? Um, but I think that not admitting that means that they're subjecting themselves to undue criticism. Because then when they say, oh, well, climate change is real, it's been proven. Mm -hmm. And then somebody says, well, then how do you explain this? And they say, well, we, we, you know, we can't. Mm -hmm. or we, have a, we can't yet. Mm -hmm. Then it looks like, well, what, a, what a bunch of jokers. Yeah. I think that instead they should say, um, that's that's not how science works. Science mm -hmm. doesn't have to give you a proof. The science doesn't have to be, uh, you know, complete consensus in order for the belief to be warranted. That's the that's the key to the kingdom in science, right? Kind of like has um, to be justified by the evidence, and if it's justified by the evidence, so if you've got two theories and this one is better justified by the evidence, yeah. then this one has warrant. Even if it's wrong, it still is warranted for belief. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, back to you then, how do you, how do you balance that out in your mind over which is more likely mm -hmm. to be true? Yeah. 
it, it, it's a weird question. Yeah, and then I, f I guess I feel like I'm able to say yes or no, or I don't know. Let your yes be yes and your no be no type of thing. And I think a lot of scientists and people in the education field at that level feel uncomfortable with saying yes or no. Because these theories are like a drug to a lot of these people. And it's more fun to philosophize about what may or may not be than to actually just go through the process and find out whether my car can go 120 miles an hour or not, right? Yeah, it's got a V6, you know, it's got some good tires on it. I just changed the oil uh, and so on and so on. And so you can assume that your car can go really fast, but until you actually do it, you know, you're not going to be able to really know. So it's just an idea. I mean, again, I might talk philosophy from it rather than science, but I mean, there's something in philosophy since called fallibilism, mm -hmm. which means that you have to admit that even though you think your theory is well justified based mm -hmm. on the evidence, it could be wrong. Mm -hmm. sure. And again, I, I, I think we agree on something interesting here, which is what you said, the more honest thing would be saying yes, no, or I don't know. And sometimes the... You saw it in the videos that you showed the anger mm -hmm. of thinking that you had the truth mm -hmm. and then having it questioned makes people furious. Mm -hmm. And I see this in scientists sometimes when they get uh, questioned about climate change or evolution or whether vaccines cause autism or something that they feel has reached a level of warmth that it shouldn't be questioned anymore. Mm -hmm. But of course, that's not how science works. But rather than say, look, there's a consensus among scientists, mm -hmm. we have overwhelming evidence that this is true. Mm -hmm. You know, it would be a one in a trillion shot if this weren't true. Mm -hmm. Rather than say that, we'll say, we've proven it. Mm -hmm. We're leaving themselves a big target on the back mm -hmm. to get attacked. So I, yeah. I like your answer very much. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah. I like your answer very much for that. Do you feel like the flat earth just I mean from what you've experienced in the flat earth community maybe videos and maybe you've gone into some live Google Hangouts or whatever online where flat earthers who are like minded are discussing various topics and experiments and observations that they've made do you feel you get the sense that we are policing each other and there are peer reviews going on where we feel like we're quote scientists and we feel pretty confident about the observations that we're doing? It, 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 it's, hard, it's hard to say because we're, a, lot of, a lot of that is social, right? Okay. You can't just work in your own silo and then everybody check your work. Mm -hmm. And so inviting people to check your work is, is actually scientific. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to do. Look, so how many people said that you don't need the money, you don't have the budget, you know, to do what you mm -hmm. need to do. But the one, the one thing that rings falsely for me mm -hmm. is the sense in which people are not anxious to prove somebody else wrong. Mm -hmm. The extent to which if you say, wow, oh, that's interesting, I never thought about it, it must be true, versus saying, that sounds interesting, I'm going to check that because it might be wrong. Right. That's the difference. Yeah. And that, that's the scientific attitude, right? Mm -hmm. And I actually am quite uh, liberal about that. Um, there, was a, there was a lab in, uh, at Princeton in the basement of the engineering department called the Princeton Engineering Anomaly. Anomalies Research Lab, and they studied uh, telekinesis for 28 years. Mm -hmm. You had a random number generator, mm -hmm. and they thought that people who had extrasensory abilities, or, or I guess that's wrong, telekinetic abilities, could influence it. Mm -hmm. and, and they studied it in a scientific way for 28 years, and people made all sorts of fun of it. Mm -hmm. But these were controlled experiments, which interestingly, found a tiny, tiny, tiny infinitesimally small effect. Mm -hmm. um, so something like that, I think it's terrific. I think it's terrific that it's taken seriously, that it's tested, that it's not just ridiculed and you, know, you, 
you can't mm-hmm. you can't study that. This is not interesting. Yeah. You know, you're, you're amateurs. You know, what do you think you're doing? I think it should be taken seriously. But the, but the price of that is you got to get the things right about the Coriolis effect mm-hmm. and about the Foucault pendulum because I actually think there are better answers than the ones that you guys are giving. Okay. I th- really, yeah, that's fine. Right. I think that the, the answer about the Foucault pendulum, you've got a much better answer at hand, mm-hmm. which is that if the stars and the moon are spinning, it doesn't, that explains the effect. It's kind of like Ptolemy versus Copernicus. They had a different theory to explain the same observations. Mm-hmm. You're kind of in that spot, right? So a number of the things that I saw today, you've got explanations for it. It's just that it's not a um, round earth explanation. Mm-hmm. You can ex- you know, like the thing about the seasons, you want to explain sure. the same effect. Yeah. But I think that that means that you've got to be willing to get ground on the things that you can't explain, mm-hmm. where and say, we can't explain this. Because yeah. that ran a little fast. <coughs> and the seleno, the seleno lion is something that scientists can't explain. And that's during, I believe, a lunar eclipse is when the sun and the moon are in the same horizon together at the same time. And, the, you know, towards the, towards the horizon. So this was the straight line? Um, are you familiar with the idea of the Selena line? I am. Okay. So, you know, when mainstream science says that they can't explain how, you know, the Earth has no effect on the two objects being in the sky, and they're claiming that it's doing something, um, they think that it, it's how it's supposed to be isn't what it is when they observe this it. This is what you're talking about? Sun, Earth, Moon? Mm-hmm. And if it's an eclipse, the Earth shadow on the moon, but if on the Earth you can see the sun and the, and the moon, mm-hmm. then it's not a straight line, it can be a shadow. Yeah. They can explain that. Well, science just says that they can. It's a phenomenon that has never been explained. I remember this from astronomy. Okay. It's explained by the uh, uh, by the uh, by the shadow. Okay. Is it it's like a superior it's, it's mirage? Be, it's because of the, no, but it's it's because of the distance. Okay. It's because of the distance, right? Um, I, it's been too many years for me to explain yeah, it. That's fine. But um, I remember in astronomy them explaining. I've never heard it called what you just called it though. Could, could mm. you it's ironically some, spelt like selenium. <laughs> S E S E L E L I O N. S E L E N. Uh huh. E L I N. O or L I O N. I call it selenolion. Some people call it selenium. I'm I'm gonna look that one up yeah. because I'm not here in Denver. My books are back in Boston, but I but I remember that from my astronomy course back before you were born. Yeah. I'll have, to, I'll have to look that one up. Um, so I guess my, my question, because you asked of it of me, what experiment or what observation, what would you have to see to get you to consider that flat earth is true? That's good. Um, so and not even, be- like, right, believe, right. quote, believe, but, like, say, okay, that... That's funny. Like that is, you know. Mm-hmm. I'm just writing in your question. Yeah. Because, like, again, we were talking about budget, right? Yeah. I don't have the budget to go straight up in the air, 62 miles, and hit the quote dome, right? If there is one. I would want to come with you. Yeah. On that. And we can hold that, hands, that would, right? That would do it. <laughs> yeah. But the other one I think that for me that would do it mm-hmm. would be the um, the Chicago skyline. Okay. Out far enough. Sure. Because if, if you went out far enough, there's no way that the superior mirage effect, I mean, there, there's a limit to how much water vapor mm-hmm. can, or, or atmosphere you know, can, can bend light. Mm-hmm. Um, you'd have to go out far enough. Okay. 
but, but so I, are you I, I say, respect the question. It's yeah. good. That's a nice. Are you? Are it sounds like you're implying that water's flat then. You know, like if you were to see well, it, it from that distance, right. right? So okay, to see so, it from that distance, so, so here's that would your, confirm water so flat. Here, so one thing I've heard a bunch of people say is that water sits at some level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But if you had a globe mm -hmm. that was covered, so let's say there were no continents. Let's okay. say the Earth were entirely water. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it's gravitational pull from the sun. It's right. orbiting. Uh, it, it's round. Mm -hmm. Tight. Um, the water is also subject to gravitational pull toward the center of the, the, uh, toward the center of the Earth, and the Earth is still spinning. Mm -hmm. So the water is curved. Mm -hmm. It's just that it's so large that you can't see it. The way that you see it is. The Chicago in the distance of that, mm -hmm. or the ship that goes hull down, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And with good enough optics, <laughs> you, you'd have to test that. So that that would be that would be a crucial test for me. Okay. Uh, and I'll and I'll put that down here as something to to think about. What is that? What is the effect when you're traveling in one direction? You feel like you get pulled like this, you know, like on the gravitron. Centripetal force. Centripetal force, yeah. right? So, if the Earth were just a complete ball, right, does centrifugal force come into play? Uh, so it's called centripetal force. Yeah, okay, it, Cent yeah, it, centripetal force, yeah. Uh, yeah, it would. Okay. Um, so, why isn't the ball Earth, or in, in the all-water Earth, why wouldn't it be more... The, <clears throat> so, the... You said before, like on the train, the train's contained system. Yeah. So, so is the Earth in its atmosphere. Okay. You know, it, it out to, you know, to a certain, I mean, with the gravitational pull, you have to overcome the escape velocity for a rock to get up to a certain point. And then it gets to the point where it's no longer subject to, to that uh, much that it's going to fall back. Okay. But this is actually a, a kind of an interesting point in physics, I was thought, that it's supposed to be that when something is orbiting, Mm -hmm. It is still under gravitational pull. It's still falling, right? It's like yeah. you throw something. Where's it, it falling it to? Like it, it's falling around. It's falling infinitely around. If that's what an orbit Okay, but is. where is the object falling to? Um, it's so. So here's the Earth. Yep. So where's the, the Earth moon. falling to? It's falling around. Where's the Earth falling to? Uh, around the sun. Okay. Where's the sun falling to? Um, there's a larger. Uh, theory which holds that the sun is uh, is also moving uh, around another. And in, in so where's that falling to? Well, it's the same. Right. You're familiar with the parabolic flight. I'll, I'll give you my yeah. line of questioning. Right. Okay. Parabolic flight. So you get 60, 70 thousand feet in the air, right? Right. And then all of a sudden you're starting to do this, right? You're doing one of these, yeah. right? So when you have water inside the parabolic flight, which is an airplane, which is an enclosed system, not affected by the outside atmosphere or anything, it's free falling, right? right. So you're going to have a spherical ball in that environment, right? right? Because it's all free falling. So where's it when it's free falling, it's going to hit the ground or else the airplane pilot has to pull up. So one of the two things, right? But in Florida, it is a free fall. I see what I see what you're saying, I mean, but what I'm saying. Newton's idea, right? But it, but it hasn't been proven though. This is a theory, correct? Everything's a theory. Right. So, what I'm trying to suggest is a different idea, that then the Earth and the Sun have to be falling to something, because if the parabolic flight airplane continues its parabolic flight, it's going to smash into the ground, right? Yeah. Okay. So where is the Earth and everything else in our solar system falling to, to create this idea? Hmm. I'm not explaining it well. No, I, I get what you're saying. Um, I'm just trying to convey that, So you know... So if you were here, mm -hmm. if you and I were here, and we were playing catch, right? Mm -hmm. And you threw the ball to me and I threw it back to you, etc. Yeah. And then we started to throw much harder. Yeah. 
and you and you threw it, you know, and you could you know, throw it up. And, and but the point is, if you threw it hard enough, the ball would go into orbit. Okay, I, I understand what you're that's saying. The, right. Yeah. And 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 I, you know, and, and mm -hmm. I get that you're you're not agreeing with that theory, but I'm just trying to show you. That yeah. According to Newtonian theory, you could explain. Um, that an orbit is a type of free fall. Mm -hmm. And that was, in fact, one of the most uh, uh, amazing things about Newtonian theory, because up until Newton... But that's still they philosophy, had, right? Well, they, they It had sounds a, like a fascinating they thought. They had a theory of falling on the Earth. Mm -hmm. I dropped this pen, it falls. Yeah. And they had a theory of orbit. Mm -hmm. He unified them. Mm -hmm. He said that they're, they're both the same force. Mm -hmm. They're both gravitational force. With, with all that being said, do you think that Newton was a spiritual man? Oh, he was. Okay. Yeah, he definitely was. He was, um, um, he spent the uh, last 20 years of his life working on uh, biblical prophecies and uh, other, yeah, okay. well, absolutely he was. So who did he believe in or what did he believe in? I don't know, he believed in God. Okay, did he believe Jesus Christ was God, manifest in the flesh? Yeah, God, I don't. Okay. That I, that I don't know. I, I, I think, given the timeline, he probably did. I mean, 16... That's an assumption, right? 40, 1650, I don't, so, I don't know. So, let's just say, for argument's sake, that he did believe in a creator, right. but he believed in the wrong creator. And so he was given these thoughts without a filter, mm -hmm. being able to say, you're mm -hmm. starting to deceive people. This thought is going to deceive a lot of people, and you need to stop with this line of thinking. But he thought he was right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So there was no, there was no um, parachute for him to keep him from continuing to go down this thought life. He had no restraint. He had no restrainer, right? Okay. Every single human being here in this conference and in this hotel has the capability of becoming a mass murderer. But there's a restrainer here that keeps people in a particular line of thinking without allowing them to get to that point where they do become a mass murderer. And that could be the same thing with these philosophies that come out, that if they continue to be propagated, they're massive deceptions then. And then those philosophies Only become true. Only if they're wrong. Who's to say that they're Who's to say that they're wrong if there's no restrainer in the community? Um, I mean, you ask a good question. This is this is where we probably part company yeah. for, for the most part because yeah. the the for science it has to be a material explanation. Uh -huh. There has to be a material explanation for, for why. Are you saying that science is overall atheistic? No. I'm, I'm not. I'm not making that claim. I'm saying that uh, Occam's razor. Mm -hmm. There has to to say gravity works the way it works because uh, it's a miracle. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a continuous miracle. Uh, it's a possible explanation, mm -hmm. but it's a less elegant scientific explanation. Okay. And so, si the, one of the charges to science is to uh, try to explain with as few hypotheses as possible, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, the, better, the best example here is evolution, right? Mm -hmm. what, what would you need in order to explain our fit with the environment? Mm -hmm. or something, something like that. And so, um, so, I'm not, so Darwin too is religious. Yeah. I'm not making but, the claim that it's, that it's atheistic, I'm making the claim mm -hmm. that, that it's, it's too easy mm -hmm. to say well, that's the way it is because that's the way God created it. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's what you're saying either. I think you're saying that there's evidence for it. Uh, mm -hmm. I think you're saying that flat earth is not something that people believe in on the basis of faith. They believe in it on the basis of evidence, mm -hmm. which may have been something that a creator put there for you to see and yeah. put your thoughts together. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I, I get that. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I mean, the way I think of it is that scientists their charge is to see how much they can explain without having to say that. Mm -hmm. Did you base your meal on somebody else's opinion or whatever, or were you able to make that choice on your own? 
Why did you choose a shrimp salad? Because I love it. Too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I mean, I asked a question because it kind of sounds like you're doing what Not you claim Rob Skiba to do uh -huh. with the woman who was pushing the block. Right. And from what I kind of am getting is that you elevate science and the educational system above your own personal experiences and what you mm. know. So you have to t you have to formulate your opinions on somebody else's opinions. Very, very good. Very good. Um, at a certain level, I have to. Okay. Because I don't know everything, and it would be impossible for any one person to gain knowledge of the world without depending, without being able to trust and rely on the work that other people have done. And I see some of that here too, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. I take trust. second and third party information right. from other people. And so the question is, um, how likely is it? To, so, so maybe <coughs> you know, you trust different people. But the question that I ask myself is, would science makes mistakes? But would a scientist deliberately lie about climate change? Cigarettes. Say? Well, they seatbelts. They weren't the ones who were asbestos. Lying. They weren't the ones who were lying about cigarettes. Plastics. Yeah. You know. They, they, you know that whole story. I don't want to change the subject. Uh, I I know that there's evidence to show through mainstream, right? So I'm taking the whistleblowers word okay. for coming out with, you know, the cigarette conspiracy. Right. Um, but if we were just to play along with that narrative they're in my opinion can I get um is is there like a little is there like a little thing of uh, uh, chipotle sauce or whatever um I can check and see for you yeah just a really small amount would okay. be great thanks so, so you, you, you I mean you, the question you just raised is a really good question because everything has to be subject in principle to observational evidence. Mm -hmm. I have to be able to say, well, look, if I trust what the scientist tells me, it means that if I had the experiment, if I could do the experiment that they claim to have done, I would see the same thing. Mm -hmm. And this is actually a, That's through uh, the scientific method. Well, it, 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 it's uh, it, replication. It, it's, yeah. it's, it's, part of, it's part of what it's, mm -hmm. it, yeah, it, it's part of what scientists do. Right. Um, now, I'm not going to say that scientists never commit fraud, but that they never make a mistake because they do. But it's supposed to be based on the idea that you could, that it's it's public and it's transparent. Mm -hmm. What you would have to do in order to be able to get the information that you needed to see if they were if what they were saying was right, or what you would have to do to disprove it. Mm -hmm. Being transparent is a terrifying thing, though. Yes. I'm transparent. Yeah. I think people can go onto my Facebook page. Right. They can look me up. You know, they can do whatever they want with, you know, my name and part of why I wanted to talk to you no, thanks. Today, yeah. today is because I saw that and because you asked the question about how many people are closeted priorities and I'm thinking, well I'm sitting here and I'm kind of closeted. <laughs> not priority, but I'm sitting here with you know, yeah, I'm not right. in the media pass. I thought, you know what? I shouldn't do that. I should, uh, you know, I should have an honest dialogue mm -hmm. and uh, and talk to you, yeah. which you know is uh, is is terrific. Yeah, it's delightful. Um, sure. I've got one more question here. Let yeah. me see which one it's going to be. Because um, we actually covered. Um, I'm intrigued by some of the other stuff that you brought up, but you didn't. Explain. Am I taking too much of time? You're totally fine. Oh, okay, because I know we both want to get to the to the debate, right? Yeah. Um, 
<coughs> How do you feel about climate change, chemtrails, evolution, vaccines and autism, all the other things that they have conferences about and that we could be talking about? Sure. Because I haven't been to those conferences. Yeah, right. And I'm just trying to get a sense of how, how the way that you've talked about trust in science mm -hmm. and trust in first-hand evidence bears on your skepticism about other forms of belief. Sure. Yeah. Because you said this is the granddaddy. I feel of as of now in where human beings have progressed and gotten to that Flat Earth is probably one of the top revolutionary thoughts in probably the last couple hundred years. Okay. You know, before we just went total globe, you know. But within, let's just even say just you know, to say our, the last hundred years, um, even though people were, still had the idea that the earth was flat and the transition to the globe was kind of happening at that time, we didn't have social media. You know, we didn't have the ability to communicate. That's been the difference. I mean, it has you, been. You, you, your, your movement has exploded in the last couple of years, and I feel lucky to be here because no, none of my philosophy friends were going to come. Nobody's Felt like it was come. worth their time? Well, they, they ridiculed it, mm -hmm. or they, without bothering to interview somebody, mm -hmm. without sitting through the sessions, without being able to think about questions about trust and mm -hmm. fraud and um, how science actually works. And mm -hmm. I, this is something I've just you know, been interested in. And so my thought was, come here see it for myself. Um, First so, hand so, experience. So even though um, we're going to leave this table still disagreeing, sure. I feel like I understand your position, and maybe you understand my position. Yeah. Right? And for me, the, yeah. for me, the crucial question is the one about we want, mm -hmm. which, which we've already yeah. talked about. But, but do, do, do you believe in... Um, all these other is that climate you yeah. that global warming is real. Do you believe that evolution is real? Do you think that vaccines cause autism? I'm, I'm just interested in the in the relationship of your beliefs. They may not yeah. be related in any yeah. theoretical way to the other, right. but it's related in the sense of uh, lack of trust for science. Yeah. Um, and I don't distrust science. I just distrust pseudoscience. Okay. You know, in, in pseudoscience, you know, the things that we ourselves can't confirm, and we've turned it into a philosophy, a story line that, because it's been talked and taught yeah. for so many decades, that it then becomes true. <coughs> and I guess I'll lead into this and then answer your question. I'm going to, I congratulate you for coming here and experiencing this firsthand. Now your your friends, mm -hmm. your philosopher friends, do you feel like your philosopher friends trust you enough to come back there and let's hey Lee, let's go out for dinner, the four of us, mm -hmm. and we really want to kind of pick your brain and find out what you got out of the conference, if it's changed you at all or anything. Uh, yes, I mean, they, they want to um, they'll want to make stories, obviously. The thing that I think that they will miss for not having been here is, uh, just to be completely honest with you, I think that they think that at a certain level that you guys don't actually believe what you say. Mm -hmm. Or that if you do believe what you say, you, you guys are lost your mind. <laughs> and so, yeah. I mean, this is nothing you haven't heard before. No, not at all. No. And so... It doesn't... So it my, doesn't I don't so do sleep thought, right. <laughs> So my thought was to take it seriously. Mm -hmm. Not because I believe it, mm -hmm. but because as somebody who cares about the openness of science, just in the same way we talked about the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Lab, mm -hmm. I want to take it seriously. Mm -hmm. And for me, I also want to take it seriously because I think... What I've been studying for the last eight, ten years is climate change. Mm -hmm. And this is, the Friday stuff is all complete new mm -hmm. to me. Yeah. And the reason I got interested in this is because I thought 
the, the form of reasoning might be similar. Yeah. I haven't been to a climate change conference. Um, maybe I should go. Yeah. But I'm interested in figuring out whether it's a whether there's a similarity mm -hmm. in the in the type of reasoning. Mm -hmm. Ca call it you know whatever you like. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe use the word skeptic that I wouldn't use, but distrusting or you know see it for yourself mm -hmm. or you know per first person observation, whatever <laughs> it is. Right? Yeah. But some of the pushback mm -hmm. against climate change seems to me very similar. That's kind of the, I don't trust, but the main argument that people give about climate change, when they don't believe in climate change is, it's a worldwide conspiracy of liberal scientists who are making money and trying to get governmental control of, um, of the economy, mm -hmm. and that that's what it's mm -hmm. about, and that the, the climate change belief is just a, a Trojan horse to get there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's not exactly the same as what I heard. Here. So I mean, my first hypothesis is, is not going to be correct. But it is, it is both seem to be based on a, on a level of distrust. Mm -hmm. Would you say that everybody in the climate change arena believes the Earth is a ball? Let's just say, for argument's sake, but, but, but that they I'll, do. But I'll tell, you, I'll tell you one thing that I feel in my bones about mm -hmm. it. I can't prove it, but I feel in my bones. Yeah. I think, I think that the same way that philosophers and scientists look down on climate change deniers, mm -hmm. climate change deniers look down on flat earthers. Yeah. Yep. And that doesn't surprise you. Really. Yeah. No. But I mean, um, because if the Earth is flat, then it totally changes the narrative for climate change. Do you have a theory of climate change? I do, yeah. Um, I feel like they have always, in the, well not always, but within the last 60 years they've had the capabilities. I, I think we're ready for the check. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thanks for, yeah, because we got to get to the debate, yeah. right? And uh, I feel like they are changing the weather on purpose for a terraforming type of environment. Okay. And I think that they're using, you know, the chemtrails, the spraying of the sky, which then falls to the ground. It's changing the soil and the growing habits um, of food. There's a video called Frankenstein. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's the one. That this That's is one with. of, you okay. know, many. I just um, gave a talk and somebody gave me the video. Which okay. I um, what are they? What in the world are they spraying? Is another one. Okay. Um, and so. I feel like, with that being said, they're manipulating. Oh, so, uh, that's together. I'm together. Yeah. Okay. Um, and we can observe things, and we can look at the sky and see a trail mm -hmm. in the sky that doesn't dissipate, and it just gets larger and larger, and then eventually we have a hazy sky. And it's not as blue as we saw yesterday afternoon. But you know the scientific explanation of that. It's contrails in water vapor. Water vapor. Yeah, water. right. Exactly. So, with that being said, I think that I come across a lot of people who... Okay, is that for you? Thank you very much. I come across a lot of people who feel like they are... have moral superiority. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. And... What a conspiracy theorist is claiming another human being is doing is totally illogical in their own personal life and experiences, that they would never do that. So then I'm going to subject other people to my own personal moral code and say, well, I wouldn't do that, so there's no way somebody else would do that. <coughs> so it's a, it's a kind of dominance? Um, intellectual, I guess, you know, maybe protecting themselves. Okay. Because if they were to go down that road, right, and right. think that somebody really is lying to us about vaccines, for example, and that information is being withheld, <coughs> a person doesn't want to go down that road and investigate, because what if they're true, uh, right? And so maybe your philosopher friends oh, this is good. are this avoiding is good. your conversation to come here 
because it would plant a seed in their mind of doubt. That's good. You, you don't know how, <laughs> how helpful that is. Yeah. You know, because I mean, I've, I've, gone, I've been a believer in Christ for about 11 years or so, and I've been to churches with great worship music, great speakers, the environment, great pastors, and the environment is overwhelming with the Holy Spirit. Like, I've, I've cried plenty of times, not just through worship music, but just the conviction in my heart by hearing what the pastor is saying, right? So what if they were to come here and listen to what some of these guys are saying, then they are with no excuse anymore. They've heard it directly from somebody instead of yeah. uh, online, which is well, which is so it impersonal. It become, well, it's it's <coughs> it's caricatured and it's not respectful. And I think it's possible to um, it's possible to have an intelligent conversation about it, mm -hmm. which kept you long enough and we need to get yeah. to, the, no, you're to fine. the thing but I, I really mm -hmm. I really can't thank you enough for doing this. I mean yeah. I, I feel like I came out here to have this conversation with you. Yeah. The whole thing this morning I really appreciate was it, Lee. so that I could learn enough to um, you know that I knew what to ask you. And well you've given I, me I a lot to think that. about. Um, and I hope it's reciprocal. Oh absolutely. But I really commend you for having your your views and your own personal convictions about your experiences in life and where it's gotten you, mm -hmm. but you still came. Yeah, you know. yeah. So. No, and I'm about as hard-headed an empiricist <laughs> uh, uh, philosopher mm -hmm. as, they, uh, as they come, but, um, you know, that's, uh, th that's part of why I wanted to come. Um, do you have any contact information I do, yeah. that I'd like to follow up?